so we can start with a quick prayer. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. We give thanks unto you, O Lord our God, who has raised us up from our beds and has put into our mouths a word of praise, that we may worship and call upon your holy name. And we entreat you by your mercies which you have exercised always in our life. Send down now your aid upon those who stand before the face of your holy glory and await the rich mercy which is from you. And grant that they may always with fear and love adore you, praise you, hymn you, and worship your inexpressible goodness. For unto you are due all glory, honor, and worship. To the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. My hope is the Father, my refuge the Son, my protection the Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity, glory to you. I place all my hope in you, Mother of God, keep me under your protection. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our second session this year of the Adult Education Program. We're going to continue our study of the, the Divine Liturgy today. Last week, just to do a quick recap, we started our discussion, we started our research and our, our study, and we talked about the opening section. We talked, first of all, about the structure of the liturgy, how there's two main parts. The first part being the liturgy of the word, the liturgy of the catechumens, which has as its focus teaching, hearing the word of Christ, hearing the gospel, hearing the sermon, and then the second section of the liturgy, which is the liturgy of the faithful, which of course leads up to and culminates with uh, the rec receiving Holy Communion. We also talked about the opening prayer of the liturgy, blessed is the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and how this is an announcement of our destination, so to speak. We talked about the petitions that open the liturgy, that petitions are short prayers uh, with a specific request, and how these talk, start our conversation with God. Because that's what the liturgy is. It's a conversation, it's a uh, discussion between us and God, and then at the end, we exchange our gifts with Him. We also talked about peace, and the theme of peace in the opening petitions and how it's important to have peace in our hearts and forgiveness in our hearts as we come to church and approach the Holy Chalice. I shared with you guys the story, hopefully you guys remember, of Saprikios and uh, Nikiforos, the two men who were, mar who were going to be martyred, and the one who lost his faith because he refused to forgive his brother. And in the same way, we lose our grace when we fail to forgive one another. We also talked about the response, Lord have mercy and how it's a statement of our gratitude to Christ and also is a statement of confession to God. All of these things we talked about and we're only about two or three pages into the Divine Liturgy so we have a long way to go. Moving on from the opening set of petitions we enter into a section of the liturgy called the antiphons. The word antiphon literally means vo two voices opposite of each other. Two voices that are taking turns in, so to speak. When there's more than one chanter or choir members, or choirs even, uh, in some churches you'll have multiple, two choirs, on, one on each side of the altar, they take turns doing these antiphons. Now when I say antiphons, our modern day antiphons are the hymns Despres Viestis Theotoku, through the intercessions of the Theotokos, the Sosonimasi uh, Etheu, Save Us, O Son of God, Who Rose from the Dead, and uh, including Omonogenisios, or the Only Begotten Son and Word of God. And then finally we have on Sundays, we have the Resurrectional Hymn of the Day. Now if we think kind of about this section of the liturgy, it kind of seems, at least to me, out of place. The liturgy is a service of, of prayer, of petition to God, and eventually of Holy Communion. So it's, it almost seems to me like a musical interlude, so to speak. Like we're pausing what we're doing to sing these hymns which have nothing to do with what we just prayed about 
and which have nothing to do with communion in a direct sense. Of course, everything we have, everything that we do in church is connected, not to say it's not. But when we sing Tiet Despres Vias, or through the intercessions of the Theotokos, it's not directly related to anything that comes before it or after it. They almost seem a little bit out of place. They're not scriptural, and like I said, they don't have anything really to do with anything else taking place in the service. So why do we sing these hymns? Why are they there? Why, are, why do we do them? Are we just trying to waste time? Are we trying to cover the prayers of the priest? What are we trying to do? Where do they come from? Well, if we really want to understand these antiphons, really want to understand where these hymns came from, we have to understand history. We have to understand uh, the liturgy and the history of the liturgy. The liturgy, in a sense, is kind of like a person. It's not something that was invented once. It's not, like an, you know, it's not something that was invented and then just stayed the same way forever and ever. It's like a person. It has a past. And it has a present, and in, in the middle, it went from one place to the other, just like all of us. We were born in a certain place, now we're a certain age, and in the middle is the story of how we got to where we are today. Same thing it is with the liturgy. And we have to understand the history to understand how we got to where we are. I want to direct your attention to this map on the second page of your packet. I think there's some extra packets if someone doesn't have one, or you guys can share with each other. This is a map, as I wrote on the top here, it's a map of... 14th century Constantinople. Now, in the ancient city of Constantinople, the churches worked a little bit differently than the way we work our churches today. Kind of today, we're kind of on an island when it comes to liturgical feast days. So when I say that is, we on so Tuesday is St. Luke. We have liturgy here. Another church is going to have liturgy at their church. The other church is going to have liturgy at their church. Every church is going to have their own liturgies that day. We're independent, so to speak, of one another in that sense. We're not uh, working together as a city to perform the liturgies and the feast days that are coming up on the schedule. Constantinople didn't work like that. For example, if you look here on your map, all the way on the right side is a very large church. You can guess that that would be Hagia Sophia. This is the main cathedral of Constantinople. And it's a beautiful and majestic structure that really has never, nothing's really been ever done to replicate anything like that. But you also see, if you look around the city map, many other churches as well. Just like we have many churches in our city, Constantinople had many, many churches and monasteries in their time as well. So when there was a feast day, Say if, for example, it's the feast day of St. John, January 7th. We're not, the, in Constantinople, they would not have had liturgy in each individual church. They would have all gone to the church of St. John the Baptist for the feast day of the parish there. On a, and every feast day had a designated church where the liturgies would take place. Okay? Does that make sense? Are there any questions about that? So every, so Christmas... Christmas was the feast of Hagia Sophia, so everybody would go to Hagia Sophia. On the high feast days, that was the main church. So how did this work? Even getting to church in ancient Constantinople was a liturgical action. It was part of the service. So for example, if we, if we had to go to Hagia Sophia for liturgy, say, say we all live on this side of town, right? And, but we have to get here for church. We don't have cars, there's no highways, okay? What we would do is we would meet at our local parish or one of the local parishes close to us. All of us would meet there. Say, for example, all of us here had to go to St. Andrew for liturgy. We would meet here, now putting it in the modern day context. It would be like us meeting here with the priests, with deacons if we had them, with the chanters, the choir, the altar boys, everybody. And we would walk from here to St. Andrew. That's what they used to do in ancient Constantinople. They would start out at a designated parish, and they would all travel together as a community to the final destination, so to speak. Now, what were they doing while they were walking? Were they walking in silence? Were they chit-chatting with each other, catching up on the local gossip? No, of course not. What they were doing is they were singing these things we call the antiphons. They were singing these hymns, and these, especially the psalms. Now, the antiphons themselves have changed over time. Back then, during the ancient days, 
It would take, obviously, a long time to walk from one church to another church. It was not a short walk, most, most of the time at least. So the hymns were very long. They were drawn out. They would sing the Psalms, entire Psalms. Uh, is everyone familiar with the book of Psalms? So in the Old Testament, King David, who came a thousand years before Christ, wrote a book of the Old Testament called the book of Psalms. And this book is made up of 151 prayers. The Psalms are essentially prayers. It was the ancient prayer book of the Jews. Okay? So in, in their worship services are loaded with the Psalms. And in our worship services, they're still there. They're still present, and we still use them. So during the antiphons in ancient Constantinople, in their processions, their processional liturgies, as we would call them, they would be singing the Psalms. But as a refrain, in between the verses of the Psalms, they would have a refrain. And eventually, at some point, the refrain was, through the intercessions of the Theotokos, save your, save us. So the main body of the antiphon was the psalm, interspersed with these hymns. And finally, at the end, they would chant it one last time, the refrain. Same thing with the second antiphon and the third antiphon, as they were going along throughout the city. Now, as time went on, the churches became more independent of one another. The processional liturgies after the fall of the, of the empire and the, the Ottoman occupation, once the Ottoman occupation started, the processional liturgies fell by the wayside. They stopped doing these things. So what happened? The people loved the antiphons so much that they kept them as part of the service, which is, what we have, which is where they're found now. But over time, they were shortened. Because when you come to church, we don't have anywhere to walk. We don't have anywhere, we're not traveling anywhere. We don't need 20 minutes of antiphons so that we can walk from here to another place. So they were shortened, and actually the psalms became kind of the secondary part, and the refrain became the main part. The Tespres Vies became the main part, which we now we sing three times. The verses that you hear are from the psalms that used to be the antiphons. When the, when the girls here in the junior choir sing the the, the the Tespres Vies, they lead it up with verses. And those verses are the old psalms that we used to sing, that the church used to sing during the antiphons. Does that make sense? Are there any questions so far about the antiphons, how we got them, how they came to be, why we still do them? So this part of the service is a remnant of that history of our church. It is a remembrance, so to speak, that... Uh, the church remembers this old tradition and we continue it to this day because it is a very beloved part and very beloved hymns of our church. So we continue doing it. Now quickly I wanted to make a uh, quick comment that like I said the liturgy is not something stagnant. It's not something that was, it's not Stonehenge. Stonehenge was built thousands of years ago and it hasn't changed since then. Besides maybe if some rocks have fallen down. Our liturgy doesn't work that way. Over time it changes. Not big changes, not major earth-shaking changes, but little by little, the, it's an organic, or it's an organism. Just like I said, just like me and you change over time, the liturgy also changes over time. Now that doesn't mean that we can change it to make it whatever we want. We can't say, ah, oh, it's too long, let's cut this out, let's cut this out, let's cut this out, uh, so it'll only be 20 minutes. No, this is not how it works. Change in the liturgy comes through cultural Influences, like I said, ancient Constantinople, Byzantine Empire eventually is conquered by the Ottomans, things change. Okay? It changed the liturgy. That historical fact changed the liturgy. So the liturgy changes over time, but it's not up to us to just change it and make it whatever we want. Okay. Now, I'd also like to make a point quickly about music in our church, because these are hymns. They're meant to be sung. They're meant to be chanted and singing out loud. And music is a really important part of our worship services. Very, very critical. For example, we, it's, first of all, we find it in the Bible. In St. Peter's first universal letter, he says, Proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His mar marvelous light. Proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. That's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. King David in the Psalms, which we mentioned earlier, he writes, Let every breath praise the Lord. That's Psalm 150. Through music, we offer our thanksgiving 
and glory to God in a very joyful way. It's an expression of our joy for all the gifts that Christ has given us. St. Paul writes here to the Ephesians. By the way, all these quotes are also found in your packet on the first page. He writes, Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So even in the Bible, we can see that we're directed in our worship to sing. As worshiping Christians, we're called to use our voices for God's praise. But we shouldn't be worried if we don't have a good voice or are not trained musicians. I feel like a lot of times people are hesitant to sing, to open their mouths and sing because they feel like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't sound good, blah, 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 whatever. We're very, very self-conscious. Well, listen to what St. John Chrysostom says. He says, every time we chant, every time we chant, in order to attract the grace of God, it is not essential, it is not essential that for the melody to be in accordance to the rules of melody. In other words, the important thing is not that the way that we sing matches the rules of the music. So if you're off, he says that's not the end of the world. He says what is needed above all is for our hearts to be broken and humbled so that our chanting will become one voice with the angelic hymns and praises and doxologies. So what is the important thing about singing in the church? It's our humility. humility. It's about lowering ourselves in front of God and praising Him and Him alone. St. John continues. He says, If the one is chanting is young or old, if he is someone who cannot sing, and if he is someone who does not have the slightest idea about melody and rhythm, it is not a sin. In divine worship there is a different need for our soul to be vigilant. Our minds should not fall asleep, but should be filled with divine light. Our hearts should beat with compunction. Our thoughts should be robust, vigorous, and our conscience should be clear and without guilt. As a, as, as a chanter, I was learning how to chant in high school. And my chant teacher was Father Dimitri Kunavis, who now serves the parish in Holy Cross uh, in justice. And he told me, along the same lines of St. John Chrysostom, the curse of the chanter is not not knowing the music. The curse of the chanter is pridefulness. Meaning, even if you're the best singer in the world and you know the music inside and out and you can sing beautifully and you bring people to tears with your music, if you don't have that humility in your hearts, you have lost all the benefit of your talent. The humility is the key. And not only in music, but in everything. In our prayers and in our daily lives, humility is paramount. Music at the time, especially in the old days, was also used as an educational tool. So back in the day, of course, not everybody was educated like we are today. Most of us nowadays are educated, a large percentage. Back then, not so much. So the church used hymns to teach people theology, the truth about Christ, the truth about the feasts of the church, and through repetition especially, people would memorize these things. In my experience, you can see that it still works, that music as a, as a teaching tool still works in two ways. One, when you look at young children, because young children, even though they're five or six years old and they barely know their ABCs and they don't know how to read yet, when it's time to sing Agios Otheos in church, they can sing Agios Otheos in church with everybody, probably louder than everybody else, to be honest with you. And it comes right from their heart, and it's a true praise and worship of God. Young kids in music are like sponges. That's why in kids' shows, when you watch TV and kids' shows, it's all songs. They all sing songs. Because you want to teach the kids the ABCs, you don't teach them, okay, A, B, C, D. You sing the song, you sing the ABCs, and they learn it. Same thing in the church. They're like sponges. They soak it up. My second thing in my personal experience of music as a powerful teaching tool, if you go to Greece, especially, this is my experience, if you go to Greece and you sit in church with all the old ladies, because that's mostly who's in church in Greece, even though those old ladies never spent a day in school, maybe one day in school, they know every hymn, they know the Gospels word by word. They, they can, they, you can see them saying the Gospel with the priest. 
and they know the entire liturgy by heart. And they sing with their full hearts and with joy in their hearts. So even though they were never educated through the music of the church and through our, like I said, the repetition and, the, and through their own desire and through their own zeal and love for Christ, they learned. And they, it just goes to show that you don't need a PhD to be a theologian. What you need to be a th theologian is love for Christ that you express in your worship and your prayers. Okay, now, back to the topic at hand, the antiphons. So in each liturgy, we have three antiphons. The first one, as we said, is Tespres Vies, Tis Teotoko, through the intercessions of the Theotokos. The second one, well, let's start with that first. So this short hymn is full of theology. Full of theology. So let's start. Theotokos, just for that one word, is very theological in nature. It means God-bearer. Theos, God. Tokos, the one who bears God. So what are we calling the Virgin Mary? She's the one who bore God. This implies two important theological things for us. One, that Christ, who was the one the Virgin Mary carried in her womb, is indeed God. And that he is man. Because not only is he God, but if he's carried in a woman's womb, he must be a human being as well. Because only a man can be carried in a woman's womb. So here we have the two natures of Christ revealed to us through the Virgin Mary. This hymn is therefore a summary of the Incarnation. The Incarnation, of course, we celebrate on March 25th. This is the feast where the Archangel Gabriel comes down to the Virgin Mary and says to her, you will bear a, ch a child and his name will be Jesus. And he will bring salvation to the whole world. This is the moment when Christ is conceived in the Virgin Mary's womb. The Incarnation and the two natures of Christ is critical. It's the foundation of our theology and our church's teachings, of salvation especially. Out of the seven ecumenical councils, the first five dealt with this topic specifically. That tells us, of course, that it's very, very, very important. Well, if Christ is not God, this is why it's important. If Christ is not God, He cannot save us. If Christ is not a man, and He is not one of us, and He is not united with us, He cannot lift us up because He is not one of us. He's too, he's too high above us in that case. He's transcendent. We cannot touch him. So, the theology and the, of the two natures in the incarnation, especially which we find in this term, the Theotokos, is critical. And the church had to defend it extremely hard throughout its history. It was constantly under attack through the heretics. So this hymn, through the intercessions of the Theotokos, Savior, save us, it also teaches us about our relationship with the Virgin Mary. And what is our relationship with her? Well, it's one where we pray to her to intercede for us. To beg for Christ's mercy on our behalf. Imagine this. Imagine you needed a hundred million dollar loan. Okay. What would you, how would you have a better chance to get that loan? Showing up at the bank one day and standing in front of the board of the, the loan that's going to decide your loan and just trying to make your case and hoping for the best, or if you had the CEO of the bank, or the president of the bank standing next to you, vouching for you that you should get the loan, what would you, how would you have a better chance? Of course, you would have a better chance if the president of the bank was sitting right next to you telling his own employees to give you your loan, right? So it's the same way in the spiritual life. We're in constant need, we're in a big debt, okay? We're in need of God's love, of His mercy, and His compassion. But we're not really worthy of it. We're not, we haven't done anything to earn that. So we need someone to be on our side, so to speak. Someone to vouch for us. Someone to ask on our behalf for the things that we need. And this is, of course, the Virgin Mary, God's mother, who stands next to us always and makes our request for us. In one of the prayers read in the sixth hour, so in the monastic tradition, there's prayers read every three hours. So the sixth hour is the noon prayers. So in the sixth hour, they, the priest says this prayer. Since we have no boldness on account of our many sins, since we have no boldness, you, Theotokos, beseech him that was born of you. For the supplication of a mother avails much to win the master's favor. I'll just repeat that last part. So this, for the supplication of a mother avails much to win the master's favor. And otherwise, another, say, another way of saying it is, 
Christ listens to his mother. The joke, of course, at seminary was, well, Christ was a Jew, and Jews always listen to their mothers. So when we pray to the Panagia and she prays for us, he listens to her. We have no chance on our own to be worth having our prayers answered, to be worthy of that. But when we have the Virgin Mary on our side, our, our wishes are usually granted if they're for our salvation. St. Gregory Palamas, for this region, reason, teaches that no one can approach God but only through the intercessions of the Most Holy Theotokos, through the one who gave birth to the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me repeat that again so that we can make sure that we understand the weight of what St. Gregory is telling us. No one can approach God. No one can approach God, but only through the intercessions of the Virgin Mary. Think about that. How much we need her, and how much we depend on her in our life, and what a blessing it is, especially for us, to have her as our patron saint of our church. In our church, we do not worship, of course, the Virgin Mary. She's not divine in the way that Christ is divine, which is one of the mistakes, unfortunately, of Western theology. But we honor her as our most fervent support, guide, and advocate on our behalf. So that's the first antiphon. Like I said, lots of theology. There's a lot there, a lot going on. The second antiphon is, Save us, O Son of God, who rose from the dead. We sing to you, Alleluia. This hymn proclaims the resurrection of Christ and the salvation that comes through Him. The resurrection, of course, is the central event of our Gospels and in the life of Christ. It is Christ's triumph over death and the power of the devil. Our church, to this day, testifies and gives witness that this event truly happened and that it took place for the salvation of all humans everywhere. In this hymn, we also say, Save us, O Son of God which brings us to the topic, of course, of salvation. Father Theodore Stelianopoulos, who is a biblical scholar of our church, and he was a professor at the Greek Orthodox Seminary that I attended, Holy Cross, in, in Boston, he explains that salvation is twofold. On the one hand, it is the rescue from sin and death, and on the other hand, the gift of a new way of life in God's new community distinct from the larger, twisted, and unresponsive society. So we have, not only are we saved from death and sin, we are also given a new way of life. Through the death and resurrection of Christ, we have been freed from death, in that it no longer has eternal power over us. We still, of course, one day all of us will die, but that death is no longer eternal. It is not something that will have us in prison forever. St. Athanasius explains that like seeds cast into the earth, we do not perish in our dissolution, meaning in our death. But, then, but like the seeds, we shall rise again, death having been brought to nothing by the grace of the Savior. So the Lord's resurrection has made death nothing to us. We don't have to be afraid of it. We don't have to be driven by death. Because death, if you're afraid of death, it will drive you to commit sins. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Fearing death, we prioritize our own desires and our own pleasures. Because we say, well, I only have so many years left, right? I only have so many days left. There's a phrase among the young people, I don't know if they still say it, but there's a phrase, you only live once, right? And that was an excuse to do whatever you want. You only live once. Because eventually you're going to die and your life's going to be over. And you don't want to have any regrets. That was the, that, that's the prevailing theory and mentality, unfortunately, of many people in modern day society. But Christ has freed us from this prison. Because then really, not only, not, you're not a prisoner to death only, but you're a prisoner to your own life. You feel like you're forced to have to do this and that in order to make your life seem fulfilled. But Christ has freed us from that. He's liberated us. He's done away with our fear of death because He said one day... I'm going to raise you up, and you're going to live forever with me in heaven. And you never have to fear death again. But don't forget that we said salvation is twofold. Not only are we saved from death, but we're also given something new. We're given a new way of life. He has a st Christ here has established His church, the church that we're standing in today, 2,000 years later. And He sent us the Holy Spirit so that we can be united in with Him. 
and accept his gift of eternal life. We therefore are called to live according to this new way of life, leaving behind us the old way of sin. St. Paul says to the Ephesians, again, you can find this in your quote sheet here, you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles, meaning don't be like those who have not accepted Christ, being alienated from God because of the ignorance that is in them, having given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness and greediness. So he's saying don't be like the rest of the world that has not accepted Christ, that is only seeking their own pleasures and is greedy. Okay? Don't be sinful the way you used to be, in other words. Remember, he's speaking to people that used to be part of that world. So he's saying, don't go back to the way that you used to be. And he says, you have not so learned Christ. What have they learned? That you put off concerning your old ways the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. St. Paul, what he's telling us is, when you become a Christian, when you accept Christ, you accept a new life. You become, in a sense, a renewed person. I won't say a new person. God doesn't destroy us and then make a new person. He takes what was there and he makes it new again. So we have to, we have a responsibility, therefore, to live our lives according to this new way. Not the old way, not the way of sin, not the way of the world that doesn't know who Christ is. And this, of course, is very difficult in our modern day society because outside of our little pockets of Christianity, we're surrounded completely by many things that draw us away, unfortunately, from our Savior. So we have to be careful and listen to It's amazing how the words of St. Paul can apply even today. Don't be like the ones who do not know Christ, don't be like your old selves. Be like the new man I have created you to be. Okay. Once the chanters or the choir finish singing the Save Us, O Son of God, for the third time, we sing the hymn, O Monogenis Ios, Only Begotten Word, Son and Word of God. This hymn was actually written in the 6th century by Justinian the Emperor. He was the emperor of the, of the Byzantine Empire, and he wrote this during the 5th Ecumenical Council. Emperor Justinian was a great emperor. He's one of the great emperors of, of the Byzantine Empire. And he's built Hagia Sophia. So this hymn that he wrote is a summary, in a way, of the two previous antiphons. First, he says Christ is God, but he accepted also to become a man through the Theotokos, which is what we talked about with the Incarnation. Second, through his crucifixion, he destroyed death, which we also talked about. Finally, we pray to him to save us because he has the power to save us, because he is one of the Holy Trinity. St. Nicholas Cavasilas, who wrote a long commentary on the liturgy, he comments on this hymn. He says, In this hymn we see that God is in charge of the battle against evil for the sake of his people. For he also was a perfect man. And as man he conquers sin, and he is unblemished by sin, since he also was God. In this way, the human race is released from disgrace and is crowned with the laurel of victory, for sin has been vanquished. So just like the ancient Olympians were given the laurel crown uh, when they would win the races in Olympia, in ancient Olympia, he's saying Christ gives us the crown through his own efforts, not through our own. The last antiphon, quickly, is the resurrection hymn of the week, which in modern practice is only chanted once. We chant this resurrection hymn because every Sunday in our church is a mini Pascha. It's a mini celebration of Christ's resurrection from the dead. As you know, of course, we don't chant the, the central hymn of Pascha. We don't chant Christos Anesti. We don't chant Christ is risen every Sunday. But instead, there are eight additional resurrectional hymns, one for each of the eight modes of Byzantine music. Without getting too deep into Byzantine music theory, we could be here, we could have five years of lessons on that by itself. Every hymn falls into one of eight modes or tones. Each mode has its own particular patterns, its own bass notes, its own ethos, so to speak. So each Sunday, one mode is highlighted. And for the Vespers, the Orthros, and the Liturgy of Sunday, we say that's the mode of the week. So each mode also has its own resurrectional hymn. 
And this is the hymn that we sing at the end of Vespers, at the beginning of Orthros, and during the antiphons of the Divine Liturgy. So they are not only different because the music sounds different, but that their content is different. It's not like we have the same hymn with the same words, but we just change the music so it sounds differently. Instead, each hymn highlights different parts of the resurrection story. One hymn has the stone that seals the tomb and the guard at the tomb. The next hymn highlights the Christ's descent into Hades. The next hymn highlights the joy of heaven at the resurrection. The next, the announcement of the angel to the myrrh-bearing women. The eternal nature of Christ. The Virgin Mary seeing her risen son. The thief next to Christ on the cross and the myrrh-bearing women. And the three days in the tomb. On the feast days and weekdays services, however, we don't use these hymns, but we use the hymns of whatever feast is of the day. For example, on Panagias on August 15th, we sing Antigenisi Tim Parthenian Philoxas. During each antiphon, my last note here, during each antiphon, the priest reads a prayer at the altar table. I have the prayers listed for you on the last page or in the second page of the quote sheet there. You can read them at your own convenience. The content of these prayers illustrates that the antiphons are indeed steps towards God's kingdom in the liturgy. Imagine if we were preparing for a long journey. We would need to pack ourselves with many supplies to help us reach our destination. In the same way, the prayers of the antiphons, we ask God to give us everything that we need to be united with Him in the liturgy and in our lives. We pray for mercy and compassion. We pray for God to save us and to bless us. We pray for sanctification and glorification. For God to answer our prayers and our petitions. For the knowledge of the truth and for eternal life in the age to come. And so with all these things, we make our initial movement towards God. And we'll see in our next session that we'll continue taking steps towards God with the small entrance and the Trisagion hymn. At this time, I'll take I have a few quick minutes. If there's anybody has any questions, we have about five minutes. On anything that we discussed today, the antiphons, the Theotokos, yes. The third antiphon, as I said, is the resurrectional hymn. We call them Apolitikia. It's the resurrectional Apolitikia for the day. So it's one of those eight resurrectional hymns that falls into one of the eight modes of Byzantine music. So that's what's in there, yes. Every week, the resurrectional Apolitikion is listed in the bulletin. And you'll see that every week it changes. The only time it doesn't change is after Pascha, because we sing Christos Anesti for 40 days. So you'll, you can find it every week, take a look, and you'll see that it's a different hymn every week in a different mode. I think it even says what mode it's in. It'll say Resurrectional Apolitikion of Plague of Fourth Mode, whatever, whatever it is for the week. So you can find that in your bulletin as well. John, you have a question? Yes. There's three. There's three. Omonogenisios is part of the second antiphon. It's included in the second antiphon. And then the resurrection of Apolitikion would be the third uh, antiphon. Again, in the old days, these were the refrains. So now it's very quick. We can sing this presvias three times in one or two minutes. In the old days, it would have the whole psalm. It would take a long time to chant. So kind of reversed uh, course a little bit with the antiphons. But we still love these hymns, and uh, they're a beloved part of our, our worship services. Are there? Yes. Uh, that's a good, so the question was, for those of you that didn't hear, why does the church not encourage the, uh, everyone to sing? Uh, that's a, this is a development, really, of the modern day, I would say, personally. I have not researched this topic specifically. In the early days of the church, singing was congregational. So the whole church would sing congregationally. And there still are churches, actually, that do congregational singing. Yeah, there's, there are churches that do congregational singing. Um... A lot of times people feel like they're not supposed to sing with the chanters or they're not supposed to sing with the choirs. I always encourage people to sing. Even if you're, if you're sitting in the pews and, and you, can, if you know, you know, Agus Otheos, or even if you don't know it, if you just want to sing along, there's no singing police that's going to come and arrest you, you know what I mean, Because for singing with the chanters. Um, obviously, there are some hymns that are very complicated. For example, the Cherubic hymn is a very difficult and long, complicated piece. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't sing with it or, you know, the, the girls down here, we do the same true Kim every week. So over time, you can learn it. So once, you know, once you're comfortable with it, sing along. I always encourage people to sing along. Other people may not feel so inclined. 
I don't know why, but it's, you, I, I do agree with you that I feel like most people have this concept that they shouldn't sing in church because they're not chanters or they don't sing in the choir. This is not, I, would, I would say this is not part of our church's tradition. So if you guys want to sing in church, I, I highly recommend it. With one voice, you know, God, we're, we're called to pray all together with one voice. So, God willing, also when you sing, it helps you to focus, you know what I mean? If you're, if you're sitting while the chanters are chanting, and they're, you know, especially during Holy Week, and we have, you know, the chanters are chanting 20, 30 minutes, it's very difficult, can be very difficult to pay attention for so long. But if you're singing along, even doing the best that you can, it helps you to stay focused. You can focus on the words of the hymns, which are wonderful, and they really give us... They give us so much food for our souls, the hymns of our church. So I highly encourage everyone to sing. What was that? Of course, yes. As, as people in church, yeah. Spectators, yeah. Yes. You, should not, you shouldn't feel like spectators at a, at a ball game when you come to church. You should be engaged, praying with the liturgy. Uh, singing the hymns, especially the ones that you know and are comfortable. Obviously, if you're comfortable singing, some people are not comfortable singing, as we said earlier. But don't let that stop you. You know, if you want to sing, sing. So that's what I would say. Are there any other questions about the antiphons, about the liturgy that we've talked about so far? No questions. Wonderful. Well, God bless. Take care. Thank you for being here, and we'll meet again next month for session number three. In a presbyter's I keep me ton theoto con que prostasies a me ton theoto nel pidan ta fos que ne crosis fui que cratisen os garzo is mi terra Prostin zoin me tes disen, o mi trani kisas, ai parthenon.